Welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. I'm John Loma King. Thank you for taking the time to join us. We're talking about the mystery of the gospel and so many people wonder, what is that mystery all about? Well, we're gonna talk about that today and allow God under the direction of his Holy Spirit to open our minds, open his word, and we pray that you'll open your heart to receive what the Spirit has to say. Before we go any further though, Let's introduce our Sabbath School panel, which as you might know by now is just all family. Amen. Shelley, good to have you here. Shelley Quinn. Oh, it's such a joy. We're so glad you're joining us. I have Monday, the long hidden mystery of the gospel. And Pastor Denzi, good to have you here. It's a blessing for me to be here as well. I have Tuesday, the church revealer of God's wisdom. Wow, and I know Jill probably has at least one item on her list. <laughs> <laughs> we got five today. Okay. On Wednesday, we're looking at Christ dwelling in your heart. Good to have you here, Jill Morricone. And Daniel Perrin, all the way down where the book ends today. Mm -hmm. Down at the end, and Thursday's lesson takes us to the very middle of the book of Ephesians, glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Well, Daniel, would you have our prayer for us before we I dive into happy the lesson? To. Yes. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, Lord, it's one thing to come before you on our own, which we must have day by day. But when we come before you together, searching your word, we know that we are uh, brought closer to each other, closer to you, closer to the cross, and closer to your kingdom. As we uh, listen and as we uh, present and share and study today, fill us with your wisdom and your wisdom alone. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you so much. <clears throat> Talking about the mystery. You know, Ephesians chapter three begins with a prepositional phrase. When you think about what Paul is writing and how he's writing it, he begins with the phrase, for this reason. And then he breaks it into two parts from verses one to 13 and then verses 14 to 21. And he makes it very clear that um, the reason for his present circumstances, he lists the two reasons why he is incarcerated, but I find it interesting, and I begin, I'll talk about the prepositional phrase in just a moment. I find it interesting that while he is a Roman prisoner, he identifies himself as being incarcerated for someone else. Hmm. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for the Gentiles. Hmm. And then he contributes his incarceration to, I'm doing this if it causes my freedom to get the gospel to the Gentiles, I'm willing to give that away so someone could receive the knowledge of Christ. So I wanna talk about the prisoner of the Lord because this was continuous throughout the writings of the Apostle Paul. From his early days to the very ending of his life, he talked about his imprisonment. He shared it with other fellow laborers, other fellow prisoners that were in similar situations for sharing the gospel. Let's look at a couple of those examples. Uh, Ephesians 4 verse one. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now you might think, will my calling uh, lead me to be incarcerated? It might. You'll find out why in just a moment. Colossians 4 verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you receive instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Paul is saying that from prison. Then we find in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 8, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, mm. but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. The gospel is something that is always anathema to the world and the world is anathema to the gospel. When you proclaim what the Lord wants you to proclaim, it's gonna get you in trouble. Matter of fact, one of my church members said, Pastor, if you keep preaching that way, you're gonna get arrested. I said, well, then I'll start prison ministry. And so <laughs> I don't wanna start prison ministry. I don't, I'm not aiming for jail, but there's a reason that the Lord says you'll be brought before judges and magistrates to give a testimony. And then he said, the time will come and even those who kill you will think they offer God's service in John 16, verse 13. But he said, these things they will do because they have not known me and they have not known the Father. Let's look at Philemon 1, verse 1. 
Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. Notice, in all the locations that Paul visited and ministered, he found himself imprisoned. Hmm. We go to Philemon 1, verse 7 to 9, and he talks about why. For we have great joy and consolation in your love. He's saying this from a prison cell. Because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ mm -hmm. to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. Being such, as, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So Philemon is identifying with Paul. He was a prisoner. I'm a prisoner. And then 2 Timothy 1 and verse 8. I, I, I brought this up earlier, but I'll leave that. I don't want to repeat that. But Paul looked at hardship as evidence of faithfulness. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. Hardship is a part of being faithful. He says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Notice he's not saying this is for me. He's saying, I'm doing this for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Here's the point. If they found fault in Jesus, and if Jesus was arrested and tried in an unjust tribunal, what makes us any different? Mm -hmm. And he says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Second Corinthians 12 and verse 10. And then he talks about how being persecuted is the evidence of your faithfulness. Now, I always say sometimes, if somebody's not facing trial, I question their faithfulness. Sometimes Christians say to me, I've never been through trials. I've never had any hardship as a Christian. Well, you have to ask yourself, why? Because the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, yes, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Yes. As Pastor Sia used to say, if you haven't gone through it yet, it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. <laughs> Be faithful and you will have your day, as I say, in court. The Apostle Paul also reveals the reason why he was willing to be a prisoner. We find in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, let's look at that together. He says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. This thought came to my mind. How many prisoners are going to be in the kingdom because Paul was incarcerated? Mm -hmm. You know, if you get incarcerated, I heard the story about a man. I was reading a book called Mental Fitness, uh, Mental Toughness. And uh, they tell a story about a man who was incarcerated and th it, it, it so affected the prisoners that they let him out early because they said, he's changing our jail. <laughs> the prisoners were being uh, changed. Their lives were being transformed by this man's uh, faithful impact on those who were being incarcerated. To keep the prison in a drabbed condition, they, they let this man out early. They said, he's changing our prison. If I go to prison, I hope that those who are there will be changed to get to know Jesus. Then Paul also in verse 13 encourages the Ephesians not to be incarcerated, not to be discouraged by his incarceration. Notice what he says. Therefore, I ask you, do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is for your glory. Sometimes people face hardships but when we do for the reason that will exalt Christ, it shouldn't bring us to the point of hardship or it shouldn't bring us to the point of, oh, I'm so sorry for them. They're going through so much. Sometimes we have to go through much. Jesus Christ has gone through much more. If we go through anything that's temporary, let's consider the sufferings of this present life to not be worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So Jill, I have, uh, let me see, I have seven takeaways today. Okay. So let's look at that together. First of all, I'm going to bring out uh, Colossians 1, verse 24 to 27, because let's talk about what the mystery is before we go any farther. Mm -hmm. Colossians 1, verse 24 to 27, and the Apostle Paul writes, I now rejoice in my suffering for you. There he is again. Mm -hmm. and, fill up, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you. 
to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints in verse 27, to them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul the apostle was incarcerated because he was determined that there will be no separation between the Jews and the Gentiles, which for both of those individuals and both of those classes of people, the gospel was available. So here are the seven takeaways. One, don't allow trials to deter your faithfulness. Matthew 5 and verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Second point, don't look at trials as um, uh, unrelenting. Don't look at trials as something that could deter your faithfulness. First Peter 4 verse 12 and to 14, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are approached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit and glory of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. The third point, trials are allowed by God as a point sometimes of refinement. Hebrews 12 and verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The fourth one, persecution is the default for faithfulness. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Number five, persecution cannot eclipse the future blessing. Romans 8, 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Number six, learn how to sing through your persecution. <laughs> Acts 16, verse 24 to 25, having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And number seven, the gospel should unite us, not divide us. Romans 10, verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is over all, enriched to all who calls upon you. And finally, Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, but you are all one in Christ. That's the mystery of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that foundation. My name is Shelley Quinn. I have Monday's lesson, The Long Hidden Mystery of the Gospel. Let's begin with Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 6. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how, how that by revelation, he made known to me the, the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles, here it is, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs mm -hmm. of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. I have to say this. The Old Testament certainly was not silent about God's grace and blessings, mm -hmm. the salvation blessings that he had intended for the Gentiles. Right. Genesis 12, 3, God promises Abraham, in you all the nations and the families of the earth will be blessed. Okay. Genesis 26, verse 4, he talks to Isaac when renewing the everlasting covenant. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 28, 14, he's renewing the covenant with Jacob. This is the everlasting covenant. And he says to Jacob, in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, to me, the most significant ones are the servant songs. 
in Isaiah 42, verse 6, this is the first servant song. It's speaking of the Messiah Christ. And this is the Lord. And he says, I, the Lord, have called you mm. in righteousness. I will hold your hand. He's speaking of the Messiah. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light mm. to the Gentiles. Then you go to the second servant song in Isaiah 49, 6. He's, indeed, he says, speaking to the Messiah, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, not just the Jews, or to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, this is interesting. The promise of the everlasting covenant of righteousness by faith shows that God's plan of salvation had no geographic or ethnic boundaries. Mm -hmm. His revelation was frequent, but it was never fully understood. Mm -hmm. Now, see, when Paul says he's revealing a mystery, it's not in the sense that it was a secret, mm -hmm. but that it was un recognized. You could look at the history of the Jews. They, the national history of the Jews shows they could not comprehend the extent of God's plan for the Gentiles. They didn't realize that all beliefs, believers of all nationalities would come together to be one body and that the Messiah Christ would be the head. Listen to this. Hebrews 4, 2, I love this verse. Hmm. Hebrews 4, 2 says, speaking of the first generation of the Israelites who are wandering in the desert, listen, for indeed the gospel, the good news was preached to us as well as to them. That's right. But the word they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith by those who heard it. So the everlasting gospel, the covenant of righteousness by faith was preached to the saints of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And then there's this progressive unfolding of this everlasting covenant. Each generation had some revelation, some present truth, right. but they never fully understood until the person of Jesus Christ showed up. You know, it's interesting. Prophecies never fulfilled, or excuse me, never fully understood until it is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Three times Jesus told his disciples that he was going to be beaten, tortured, crucified, and resurrect on the third day. You know what? He told them this three times. Three times it rolled right past right over the wall of their human reasoning because of preconceived opinions. Hmm. Listen to what I'm saying. Preconceived opinions. That means an opinion you form without having the Bible truth for it. Preconceived opinions effectively insulate your mind against truth. Hmm. We've got to be so careful. But Paul received a clear revelation. He said, hey, I got the revelation. When did this happen? On the road to Damascus. Jesus knocks him off his high horse, so to speak. And Jesus commissions Saul, the persecuting Saul, to be the Pharisee of Pharisees, the Hebrew of Hebrews, to be what? His ambassador of grace to the Gentiles. And he says, favorite, this is one of my favorite passages. He says, I am sending you now to these Gentiles to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. There's all three aspects of, 
of righteousness by faith. You're going to be justified when you turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. You're going to be sanctified by the power of God and you've got an inheritance. Mm -hmm. But when the Old Testament prophesied of the coming Messiah, none None of, no one realized, as you said, Colossians 1, is the bottom line, mm -hmm. that Christ would end up living in our hearts by faith, Ephesians 3, 17 says, but that he would be our hope of glory. What is the glory of God? It is the character of God. Okay. It is the light of God. There's no sin in God. It is when Christ lives inside of us that we, by the power of his word, by the power of his Holy Spirit, we walk in his righteous footsteps and begin to develop his character. Galatians 3.27, I'm not going to get through this, but... 327 through 29 talks about those who are baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. And he says, if you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, another favorite, Romans 8, 14 through 17. Paul writes to the Romans, chapter 8, so rich. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Let me ask, are you led by the Spirit of God? Hmm. Hmm. Only as you are led by the Spirit of God can you become a covenant child of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God, the children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Papa. He becomes our heavenly Father and the Spirit himself bears witness that we are children. So the mystery that Paul is proclaiming is that all who have been saved since Pentecost are united in one body, no social barriers, no racial barriers. It's all about unity in Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Shelley. Amen. We're just getting started. We have uh, three more days to cover, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 of Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abnsabbathschoolpanelcom A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. And now we go to Pastor John Dinsey as we continue our study. Thank you so much. It is uh, Tuesday's portion of the lesson. It is the church revealer of God's wisdom. And here we go into Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. And we hope to get to verse 13 before this time is over. Let's begin with verse 6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a marvelous verse. I mean, I, I, I don't really have words to describe. All these verses are full of so much rich spiritual blessings. So the Gentiles, who are those? Well, that's you and me as well. And it says they should be fellow heirs. We're not going to be left out. The Gentiles will not be left out. They can be part of the same body. And please understand, the same body, that is, we are all together. We're all one family. Uh, you know, today you have nations divided by boundaries, nations divided by flags, you know, when you have these sporting events. Uh, the nation that wins their flag, you know, flies high. But we are all one big family. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, there, there are not going to be boundaries and divisions in God's kingdom. 
and uh, partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. You are a partaker of God's promise through the gospel, the gospel, the good news. What is the good news? The good news is that you do not have to die for your sins. Jesus Christ died for you. This is the gospel. This is the, this is the message that needs to go all around the world. Yeah, 3ABN yeah. is taking this message all around the world. Tell your friends, your families about 3ABN. That they can tune in. It's easier than ever to share about 3ABN. You can tell them, you can just go to the internet and you can watch 3ABN before you know, oh, do you have this, this cable station? Do you have this <laughs> channel? No. On the internet, you can watch 3ABN. And here we go to verse 7, of which, Paul says, I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of His power. This, this verse begins to, Paul begins to amplify this idea that he became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. It's not, oh man, I have so many talents. I, I, just, I just need to be made a minister because I just have all this overwhelming That's amount right. of talents. No, God chose him. And God can do anything through anyone that places himself, herself in the hands of the Lord. Let's continue because this is, this is uh, we can't stop. Unfortunately, at one verse, we have to continue. It says, to me, notice, who am less than the least of all the saints. Stop for a moment and think about that. He's saying he's less than the least of all the saints. Oh, this is little brother, this, that's the least of the saints, that guy don't. Paul says, I am less than that guy. You know, sometimes people look at other people and they say, oh, you know, this guy has so many talents. Oh, that poor little sister over there, she's only got one little talent, poor thing. No, Paul says, I am less than the least of all the saints. Mm -hmm. and he's saying, he's, he's just overwhelmed by the gift of God that was given to him. Notice what he says, this grace was given. Wow, that I, Paul, should preach among the Gentiles. Wait, what should he preach among the Gentiles? Mm -hmm. The unsearchable riches of Christ. It is true. It is unsearchable riches Amen. that we have in Christ. Amen. To think that you and I could be saved, what great love God has for you, what great love God has for me, this is beyond our understanding. Paul, you know, you can see his, his humility here. Uh, when he first started out, Paul was like, hey, wait a minute, I'm Paul. I am Paul, you know. I, I am uh, from the stock of Israel. I am this and this and this and that. But now Paul is saying, I am less than the least of all saints. I don't know how you consider yourself. Perhaps in your church, you may say, well, I have this position. I am a Sabbath school teacher. I am an elder. I'm a deacon. I, I, you know, we are all one in Christ. Amen. We are all one in Christ. And, and he, just, he just, I'm less than the least of all saints. This grace was given. Uh, in the lesson, uh, Dr. McVeigh uh, brought out a, a wonderful um, message from the book Steps to Christ. He's quoting here and he says, perhaps this line of thinking here by Paul can explain this famous quote by Ellen G. White. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes for your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contracts, contrast to his perfect nature. Our eyes right now cannot really under, uh, behold what we really are, but the closer we come to Christ and see His beauty, His perfection, His righteousness, His holiness, we will begin to understand what our place should be to exalt Jesus, Amen. to exalt Him because He is worthy of all praise. And He says this grace, and again, the word grace, uh, the Greek word charis, what uh, kind of words come out to, to you as you think of this word grace? Some of the Hebrew, I mean Greek definitions, grace, goodwill, loving kindness. It is through the loving kindness of God that we get the gifts that God gives to us. Yeah. And every good and perfect gift, gift comes from above. our heaven above and God in heaven above. And it says he has to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Think of the richness of these words. Consider Jesus, Jesus Christ, who came to this sin-darkened world. I don't know uh, if you've given some thought to that. This world 
It's a horrible, horrible place. It was horrible in the time of Christ. He came to the time when the world was really dark with evil. Satan was doing a, a job that you can, if you were to, to, to examine what he did and say, well, you know, uh, gotta give it to him. He did a good job. People were just uh, uh, in the sense of how much wickedness were around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, people were just demon possessed and he came to make a difference in the world. Wherever he went, Jesus brought light. Wherever he went, there was comfort, there was healing. Lives were transformed and the unsearchable riches of Christ. Perhaps you have a story of how God has rescued you. Share that story with Jesus because that is sharing part of the unsearchable riches of Christ. He saved me from a world of wickedness. He saved me from a life of evil the unsearchable riches of Christ. Consider Jesus, lift him up in your testimony because he is worthy of all praise. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. I don't know if we're talking to somebody that maybe has killed people, that maybe has committed adultery, lived a very wicked life and thinking you're not worthy, you're not, uh, Jesus Christ could not possibly save me, but yes, he came to save you. He came to save me. We are blessed. Amen. with the understanding Thank that you. He is able to save whoever, whomever, whatever you have done. Ephesians 3, 9 says, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ Jesus, mm. to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. church. That's you and I. We should, by the grace of the Lord, Ask Him to give us words. Ask Him to give us opportunities to share the manifold wisdom of God. Who can conceive such a marvelous plan, the plan of redemption? Mm. I mean, we don't fully understand this great plan of redemption. We need to study this uh, and dedicate time to uh, understand. And, and you say, you know, try as hard as you can to understand this because the more you do, the more God opens Amen. the door, Amen. opens and gives you light. I'm quoting to you from the book, Education, page 308. In the plan of redemption, there are heights and depths that eternity itself can never exhaust. Marvels into which the angels desire to look into. The redeemed only of all created beings have in their own experience known the actual conflict with sin. They have wrought with Christ and even as the angels could not do, have entered into fellowship of his sufferings. Mm -hmm. This plan of redemption demands our attention mm -hmm. even in this time that we live in. A lot of things are calling for our attention. New apps, new toys, uh, new technology coming out, uh, new shows, new movies, they're calling for our attention. Yeah. Uh, whatever it is out there, calling for our attention. But what should call our attention? What should be the priority? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Amen. That should be our priority. This is the time that we're living. We're living in dangerous time. Now more than ever, we should study the Word of God so that we may be prepared for what is coming upon the earth. We got only to verse 10. I'm going to read verse 11 just to give you a little more taste. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, verse 12, sorry, I got to include that, in whom we have boldness and yeah. access with confidence through faith in him. God blessed be his holy name. I have to stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny and Shelly and Pastor John. What an incredible lesson. I'm Jill Morricone. On Wednesday, we look at Christ dwelling in your heart. Amen. You know, we can know about him, but yet we've never met him. We can proclaim the doctrines and the truth in his word, but we've never been changed in our character, our attitude, our behavior. We can even teach who Jesus is, but we never talked with him or walked with him or experienced his love and grace for ourselves. What does it really mean to have Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith? We pick up the prayer that Paul started in Ephesians 3 verse 1, and then he interrupted it or interrupted himself, you could say. 
to talk about the mystery of the gospel. Now we go back to that prayer and the same phrase that we started with verse one for this reason, we pick it up with this prayer. This is, we're in Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 16. We're gonna pick it up there. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you're gonna notice here, we have the Godhead present. We have God the Father. We have the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might, dunamis, miracle working power through his spirit in the inner man. Now we go to verse 17, the crux of the matter. That, why is this prayer? Why is God the Father, God the Son? Why is the Holy Spirit involved? Why this prayer? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now the word dwell in Greek, okio, happens quite often and we use it a lot and it means to settle down, take up residence. But this word is actually even a stronger word, if you could call it that, for it. It means to house permanently, to take up permanent residence. Christ may dwell. In other words, he's going to settle down and abide forever in our hearts through faith. Do you have Christ in your heart? Are you Christ-like? Have you ever held on to a grudge or nursed bitterness or unforgiveness? Have you ever gossiped about somebody else? Have you ever taken out anger or frustration on someone else? Have you ever wished for something that wasn't yours or held on to a thought that was impure? Have you ever reacted to someone else with a critical or judgmental spirit? Hmm. Have you ever indulged feelings of your own self-importance? And when I ask these questions, I look at my heart. I've probably done all of that. Conversely, do you love other people? Do you walk in peace with others? Do you freely forgive? Do you react in kindness? Do you seek to encourage? Do you stand for principle no matter what? Is Christ in your hearts? We're gonna to get to our five takeaways, Pastor John. How Christ can dwell in our hearts because that's what I want. I want to be a Christian where Christ dwells in my heart. Let's keep going, we're in verse 17 that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Christians, these are those with Christ in their hearts are to be settled in our identity with Christ. Hmm. We're rooted and grounded in love. Love is the foundation on which our Christian experience is to be built. Christians are to experience and understand the love of Christ. These four dimensions, the immensity of the love of Christ, the length and the breadth and the width and the height. Christians, those who Christ dwells in their hearts, are to be filled with the fullness of God. We are to experience the constant presence of God in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. So how does Christ dwell in our hearts? How does that happen? Here's five steps for Christ to dwell in your heart through faith. Step number one, acknowledge your inability to change yourself. When I read that list before of just stuff, I guess we could call it stuff. This is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. This is just the temptations that we're surrounded with on a daily basis. Do you acknowledge that, wow, I've indulged in that. I've stepped into that. I have, I have fallen away from God's ideal for my life. Just acknowledge that we can't change ourselves. Acknowledge your inability to change yourself. Isaiah 64 verse six, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's nothing we can do in and of ourselves to be made holy or to be made righteous. My nephew, he's older now, but when he was two, I still remember him having a little temper tantrum, two years old, throwing himself on the floor, kicking his feet and his hands and his crying, angry, you know, little kid temper tantrum. But I'll never forget the words in the midst of that temper tantrum, Jesus, help me be good. Jesus, 
help me be good. You see, even a little child, if mm -hmm. they're taught, understands that of ourselves we can't be good. That's Acknowledge right. your inability to change yourself. Number two, choose your master. Now this is a daily and a moment by moment mm -hmm. decision. Romans 6 verse 16, do you not know to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slaves to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. You see, every morning when we wake up, we have a choice to make. Am I going to follow the desires, the carnal nature in, in myself? Am I going to follow and walk out those desires or am I going to choose Jesus, which leads to obedience and leads to righteousness? Make a choice. Choose your master. And it's not just every morning. It's throughout the day when we're faced with those daily decisions. Step number three, accept him by faith. Did you notice when we read in Ephesians 3, 17, it says Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. How does he dwell? He dwells through faith. I love this sentence and I claim it often because I can be a feeling type of girl. When you can't feel him with your feelings, feel him with your faith. What does that mean? We're not saved by how we feel. We're saved by the blood of Jesus. We're not forgiven by how we feel. We're forgiven by the word of God. He does not dwell in our hearts by feelings. He dwells in our hearts by faith. God stands back of every promise that he has made in the word of God. And you do not accept and claim those promises by feeling. You accept and claim it by faith. That's right. Step number four, ask for the Holy Spirit. There's a battle in Romans chapter 7. We've talked about it before. This is lust between, uh, strife, not lust, strife between the lust of the flesh and what the Spirit wants us to do. And we say the things, Pastor Johnny, that, that I really want to do, I'm not doing those things. And the things I know I shouldn't be doing, those are the things I'm doing. This mm -hmm. battle, this war takes place. In fact, at the end of the chapter, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. He's miserable. Who can deliver me from this body of death? You get to the next chapter, chapter eight, and you discover what happens. Enter the power of the Holy Spirit. When the power of the Holy Spirit enters into the life of the Christian, you're gonna see transformation. The difference is the Holy Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, has settled down and taken up residence in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You know, Jesus says in Luke chapter 11, ask and it will be given to you. That's right. Seek and you will find. And it doesn't mean just ask once, ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, right. knock and keep on knocking. And then he goes on to say, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more is the Father gonna give to the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Right. Step number five, allow him access into your heart. You know, it's not enough just to acknowledge we can't change ourselves or to choose our master, to accept it by faith, ask for the Holy Spirit. You and I have to give him all of us. Many times we hold on to things that we're afraid to give to God or we don't want to give to God. We hide things that we don't want to give up. Surrender is simply saying yes to Jesus. When he calls to your heart, those things that you don't want to give up, those things that you want to hold on to, say, God, I'm not even sure I'm willing right now, but I'm willing to be made willing. Amen. Romans 8, 13, if you live according to the flesh, you die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Choose to walk in surrender and you will have Christ dwelling in your heart. Amen. Amen. Wow, this, this study of Ephesians is powerful and it gets better each week. Amen. And uh, I hope you have Ephesians with you. Hope you got your Bible open. I've got just two verses to talk about and they're good ones. And hold on to it for a minute. It's the last two verses of Ephesians 3 and I'll get to reading it in just a minute. But first, have you ever bitten off more than you can chew? <laughs> God never bites off more than he can chew. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Jeremiah 
<laughs> when he was facing a situation he saw no possibility of, of success, he says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. That's right. He understood that. And that's the background of Paul as he's writing this to real people who were facing impossible situations. And I want to share with you also from the book Education, page 126, one sentence, every command is a promise. Amen. Accepted by the will, received into the soul, it brings with it the life of the infinite one. Nothing God asks of us is not given without the power to be to accomplish it. Right. And so with those thoughts in mind, Paul interrupts his letter for prayer. And these last two word, two verses are called a doxology, which just means a, a verbal or oral praise that, that pours out. And sometimes we speak our prayers, sometimes we write them, but you just think about walking out in a sunrise and you can't help but say, oh Lord, my life belongs to you. I'm so thankful to be yours. Uh, oftentimes Paul begins or might end his uh, letter with a prayer, just like we might at a meal or the beginning of a day, but he punctuates the middle of this letter with a prayer. I think about somebody who came and visited me where I, I worked. Uh, the first job I had after college, and uh, it was an office job for about a year while I was waiting until something else opened up. And this man walked in there, his name was Mike, and I said, what, what's your business here today? He's like, my business is to pray with you. Hmm. Like, I'll never forget that moment. Yeah. And he said these words, he said, we need an economic slowdown, stop work to pray. All right, <laughs> we should be interrupting our life to pray, interrupting our marriages, interrupting our parenting, interrupting our arguments to pray, our sermons. Mm -hmm. we, we interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special prayer. We could interrupt Sabbath school panel and I'm going to right now, will you pray with me? Mm -hmm. Dear Father in heaven, your name is glorified. We just want to add to that by uh, our words, but they're not ours. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, God, as we continue to study and speak. And I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Paul doesn't do this just here. Just there's one other place. There's a couple others, but 1 Timothy 1:17, he says, "Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the God who alone is wise, be glory and honor forever and ever." Amen. All right. The mystery, what, could, what else could he do but break out in praise to God? Some people, when they see something beautiful, what do they do? They take God's name in vain. Hmm. Paul pours out praises to his God. And here's his prayer. Verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Mm -hmm. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is not just an inactive rehearsal of religious phrases. I don't know if Paul was raising his hands or just in quiet contemplation, but he couldn't help himself. What can I do? Praise God. He starts his prayer with now. In other words, it affects this moment of my life and beyond. And now after all that we've said, the mystery, the redemption, the preacher of peace, I, I once was dead and now changed to life, saved by grace through faith as a gift of God, unity in the body, the treasure of riches, all of that explodes in a prayer here. And that prayer has no bounds. It says, God, you have no bounds. And so I'm keeping nothing out of bounds in my life. And we're going to see that it's going to cover family and work and politics and every relationship, all of those things placed at God's feet because he does exceedingly and above. And you may not know it, but in the Greek, that's the same word, huper, which from which we get hyper. Maybe you've seen a kid, you're like, that kid is hyper. In other words, he doesn't stop. And so thinking about what God does, he doesn't stop. Amen. What could you ask of God in your prayer? You're probably not asking enough. Your prayer is probably not big enough. What else could you ask? Too small. We only ask for the things that we can see, for the things that we can think of. God says, I've got things you could never 
think of. Oh, that's that's right. All right. As it was written, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor have entered in the heart of man. Some, uh, some translations say, no mind has conceived of the things which God has prepared for them who love him. This promise is vast and we limit God. We don't mean to, but we don't have the, the slightest inclination of how much God wants to do through us. Listen once again to the book, Education. What a great book. Page 18, higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, God-likeness is the goal to be reached. Before the student, there is opened a path of continual progress. He has an object to achieve, a standard to attain that includes everything good and pure and noble. He will advance as fast and as far as possible in every branch of true knowledge, but his efforts will be directed to objects as much higher than the mere selfish and temporal interests as the heavens are higher than the earth. God wants to take us higher and that advance is an advance in our character. That's right. He says this prayer is not just about what God can do for our grades or for our work or, or for our relationships. It says, I want to take you and do things in your character. Me doing the work while you work it out that you could never imagine have, were, would be possible. I could never do that. I cannot overcome this. You're right. You can't overcome that. But Christ dwelling in us mm -hmm. is going to give that power. All right. The body is going to be remade. All right. But the character, our choices, our decisions is who we are. Hmm. God doesn't change our identity. He helps us to change it, to become like his. And so we ask God, Lord, I'm having trouble with something that's causing problems in my life, a damaging relationship or something that's disturbing my peace. Help me. And God comes in and he says, I'm going to start there as I did with every, with the people in the Old and New Testament, but I'm going to keep on working on stuff you never thought was a problem. I'm going to bring to your mind things that, that could draw you closer to me that you had no intention of bringing to me, but I'm going to bring them to your mind. Mm. Jesus created the world and he looked out and he said, it's good. But those two people, Adam and Eve, and each of their descendants were expected to continue growing. There's an old kid's song. He's still working on me to make me what he wants to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and stars, sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. All right. So we can keep on advancing. One more from the book, Education. This, this sounds like a book we ought to read. Page 124, mm -hmm. he who is sincere, who is sincere and teachable spirit, studies God's word, seeking to comprehend its truths, will be brought in touch with its author. Mm -hmm. And except by his own choice, there is no limit to the possibilities of his development. Amen. God Amen. wants to take a step by step higher and higher through all eternity. And this is all accomplished by the power working in us. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 21, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The King James Version says throughout all ages, world without end. God's character has been under attack and God can't just simply say, I'm right. The enemy is wrong. It has to be demonstrated. Mm -hmm. And that demonstration is made known by what he does in us. So he puts us on display in the church to see his character revealed and lived out. Listen to this in John 15, verse eight. By this, my father is glorified. How is God glorified? That you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. God is glorified in the church, his character dwelling in us. And the prayer ends with amen. It's called the best known word in human speech. It's not translated. It came from Hebrew into Greek, into Latin and into English, the same in almost every language. Amen. It simply means it's sure or truly or agreed. It's settled as it should be trustworthy. In other words, what God promises here, what Paul is praying about, what God wants to do in you is sure, settled, trustworthy, not because of you. In fact, Jesus to the church of Laodicea is called the Amen. Right. So we get to this end of the prayer, the end of this section, the prayer, and Paul simply says, Jesus will do this. He is the Amen. 
right? He's the one who works out his will within us and all we have to do is be willing and cooperate with him. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Daniel. Amen. Such energy. Praise God for that. Great study. Wonderful Good. study. Very deep and very thorough. Shelley, what are your th thoughts before we... What's running through my mind is that you may not feel worthy. Um, I want to tell you, God has no partiality. God has no favorites. God has always intended his heart is to save all. You're worth nothing less than the price he paid for you with the precious blood of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3 verse uh, 12 talks about Jesus and it says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. You know, today you enter a code and you have access to your email. You enter a code and you have access to uh, some website. You enter a code and you have access to your checking account or savings account. Through Jesus, we have access to heaven. Through Jesus, we have access to blessings that we cannot even imagine. Through Jesus, we have access to the throne of grace and salvation. Blessed be his holy name. Amen. Amen. When you look at Christ dwelling in your hearts through faith, I love that it's rooted and grounded in love. It's not rooted and grounded in works or legalism or fear or coercion. It's always in love. When Jesus says, let your light so shine before men, what is your light? It is Jesus. He is the light of the world. Let your light so shine that men may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Thank you so much, everyone on the panel. You know, I talked about we began with the prepositional phrase and we end with that. For this reason, Paul talked about the purpose of his incarceration to get the gospel to the Gentiles. For this reason, Paul talked about the joy of his incarceration. I would rather be incarcerated and someone be freed. And so friends, if you experience any kind of tribulation, because of your faithfulness to the gospel. Remember this, and this is not a prepositional phrase. This is a promise. Romans 8 and verse 35, who shall separate us right. from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Romans 8 verse 37 to 39. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Join us next time for Lesson 7, The Unified Body of Christ. <laughs>